later. By the kindness of the board of Tread Inspector, I have been permitted to look over the logbook of the Demeter, which was in order up to within three days, but contained nothing of special interest, except as to facts of missing men. The greater interest, however, is with regard to the paper found in the bottle, which was today produced at the inquest. And a more strange narrative than the two between them unfolded has not been my lot to come across. As there is no motive for concealment, I am permitted to use them, and accordingly send you a rescript, simply omitting technical details of seamanship and supercargo. It almost seems as though the captain had been seized with some kind of mania, before he had got well into blue water, and that this had developed persistently throughout the voyage. Of course, my statement must be taken cum grano, since I am writing from the dictation of a clerk of the Russian consul, who kindly translated for me, time being short. Log of the Demeter Varna to Whitby Written 18 July Things so strange happening that I shall keep accurate note henceforth till we land. On 6 July we finished taking in cargo, silver sand and boxes of earth. At noon set sail. East wind, fresh. Crew, five hands. Two mates, cook and myself. Captain. On 11 July, at dawn, entered... Phosphorus, boarded by Turkish customs officers. Bakshish, all correct, underway at 4 p.m. On 12 July, through Dardanelles, more customs officers and flagboat of Gordon Squadron. Bakshish, again, walk of officers thorough, but quick, want us off soon, are dark, passed into archipelago. On 13 July, past Cape Matapan, crew dissatisfied about something, seemed scared, but we do not speak out. On 14 July, was somewhat anxious about crew, men, all steady fellows, who sailed with me before, mate, could not make out what was wrong, they only told him there was something, and crossed themselves. Mate lost temper with one of them that day and struck him, expected fierce quarrel, but all was quiet. On 16 July, mate reported in the morning that one of the crew, Petrovsky, was missing. Could not account for it. Took larboard watch eight bells last night. Was relieved by Abramov, but did not go to bunk. A man more downcast than ever. All said they expected something of the kind, but would not say more than that there was something aboard. Mate getting very impatient with him. Feared some trouble ahead. On 17 July, yesterday, one of the men, Olgarin, came to my cabin and in an awestruck way confided to me that he thought there was a strange man aboard the ship. He said that in his watch he had been sheltering behind the deck house as there was a rainstorm when he saw a tall, thin man, who was not like any of the crew, come up the companionway and go along the deck forward and disappear. He followed cautiously but when he got to bows found no one, and the hatchways were all closed. He was in a panic of superstitious fear, and I am afraid the panic may spread. To allay it, I shall today search entire ship carefully from stem to stern. Later in the day I got together the whole crew, and told them, as they evidently thought there was some one in the ship, we would search from stem to stern. First made angry, said it was folly, and to yield to such foolish ideas would demoralize the man. Said he would engage to keep them out of trouble with a handspike. I'll let him take the helm, while the rest began thorough search, all keeping abreast, with lanterns. We left no corner unsearched. As there were only the big wooden boxes, there were no odd corners where a man could hide. Men much relieved when search over, and went back to work cheerfully. First mate scowled, but said nothing. 22 July. Rough weather last three days, and all hands busy with sails. No time to be frightened. Men seem to have forgotten their dread. Made cheerful again, and all on good terms. Praised men for work in bad weather. 
past Gibraltar and out through straits. All well. 24 July. There seems some doom over the ship. Already a hand short, and entering on the bay of Biscay, with wild weather ahead, and yet last night another man lost. Disappeared. Like the first, he came up his watch and was not seen again. Men all in a panic of fear. Sent around Robin, asking to have double watch, as they fear to be alone. Made violent. Fear there will be some trouble, as either he or the men will do some violence. 28 July. Four days in hell, knocking about in a sort of maelstrom, and the wind a tempest. No sleep for anyone. Men all worn out. Hardly know how to set a watch, since no one fit to go on. Second mate volunteered to steer and watch, and let men snatch a few hours sleep. Wind abating. Seas still terrific, but feel them less, as ship is steadier. 29 July. Another tragedy. Had single watch tonight, as crew too tired to double. When morning watch came on deck, could find no one except steersman. Raised outcry, and all came on deck. Thorough search, but no one found. Are now without second mate, and crew in a panic. Mate and I agreed to go armed henceforth, and wait for any sign, of course. 30 July, last night. Rejoiced we are near in England. Weather fine, all sails set. Retired worn out. Slept soundly. Awaked by mate telling me that both man of watch and steersman missing. Only self and mate and two hands left to work ship. One August. Two days of fog, and not a sail sighted. Had hoped when in the English Channel to be able to signal for help or get in somewhere. Not having power to walk sails, have to run before wind. Dare not lower, as could not raise them again. We seem to be drifting to some terrible doom. Mate now more demoralized than either of men. His stronger nature seems to have worked inwardly against himself. Men are beyond fear, walking stolidly and patiently, with minds made up to worst. They are Russian. He, Romanian. 2 August, midnight. Woke up from a few minutes' sleep by hearing a cry, seemingly outside my port. Could see nothing in fog. Rushed on deck and ran against mate. Tells me, heard cry and run, but no sign of man on watch. One more gone. Lord help us. Mate says we must be past Straits of Dover, as in the moment of fog lifting we saw North Foreland, just as he heard the man cry out. If so, we are now off in the North Sea, and only God can guide us in the fog, which seems to move with us, and God seems to have deserted us. 3 August. At midnight I went to relieve the man at the wheel, but when I got to it, found no one there. The wind was steady, and as we ran before it there was no yaw in. I dared not leave it, so shouted for the mate. After a few seconds he rushed up on deck in his flannels. He looked wild-eyed and haggard, and I greatly fear his reason has given way. He came close to me and whispered hoarsely, with his mouth to my ear, as the fear in the very air might hear. It is here. I know it now. On the watch last night I saw it, like a man, tall and thin and ghastly pale. It was in the bows, and looking out, I crept behind it and gave it my knife. But the knife went through it, empty as the air. But as he spoke, he took his knife and drove it savagely into space. Then he went on. But it is here, and I'll find it. It is in the hold, perhaps. In one of those boxes, I'll unscrew them one by one and see. You work the hell. And with a warning look and his figure on his lip, he went below. There was springing up a choppy wind, and I could not leave the helm. I saw him come out on deck again with a tool chest and a lantern, and go down the forward hatchway. He is mad, stark, raving mad, and it's no use my trying to stop him. He can't hurt those big boxes. They're invoiced as clay, and to pull them about is as harmless a thing as he can do. So here I stay and mind the helm, and write these notes. I can only trust in God and wait till the fog clears. Then, if I can't steer to any harbour with the wind that is, 
I shall cut down sails and lie by, and signal for help. It is nearly all over now. Just as I was beginning to hope that the maid would come out calmer, for I heard him knocking away at something in the hold, and work is good for him, there came up the hatchway a sudden, startled scream, which made my blood run cold, and up on the deck he came as if shot from a gun. A raging madman, with his eyes rolling and his face convulsed with fear. Save me! Save me! He cried, and they looked round in the blanket of fog. His horror turned to despair, and in a steady voice he said, You had better come too, Captain, before it is too late. He is here. I know the secret now. The sea will save me from him, and it is all that is left. Before I could say a word, or move forward to seize him, he sprang on the bulwark and deliberately threw himself into the sea. I suppose I know the secret too now. It was this madman who had got rid of the men one by one, and now he has followed them himself. God help me. How am I to account for all these horrors when I get to port? When I get to port? Will that ever be? 4 August. Still fog, which the sunrise cannot pierce. Another is sunrise because I am a sailor. Why else I know not? I dared not go below. I dared not leave the helm. So here all night I stayed, and in the dimness of the night I saw it. Him! God forgive me, but the maid was right to jump overboard. It is better to die like a man, to die like a sailor in blue water, no man can object. But I am captain, and I must not leave my ship. But I shall baffle this fiend or monster, for I shall tie my hands to the wheel when my strength begins to fail. And along with them I shall tie that which he, it, dare not touch. And then, come good wind or foul, I shall save my soul and my honour as a captain. I am grown weaker, and the night is coming on. If he can look me in the face again, I may not have time to act. If we are wrecked, mayhap this bottle may be found, and those who find it may understand. If not, well that all men shall know that I have been true to my trust. God and the Blessed Virgin and the Saints help a poor, ignorant soul trying to do his duty. Of course the verdict was an open one. There is no evidence to adduce. And whether or not the man himself committed the murders, there is now none to say. The folk hold almost universally here that the captain is simply a hero, and he is to be given a public funeral. Already, it is arranged that his body is to be taken with a train of boats up the Esk for a piece, and then brought back to Tate Hill Pier and up the Abbey Steps, for he is to be buried in the churchyard on the cliff. The owners of more than a hundred boats have already given in their names as wishing to follow him to the grave. No trace has ever been found of the grey dog, at which there is much mourning, for, with public opinion in his present state, he would, I believe, be adopted by the town. Tomorrow we'll see the funeral, and so we'll end this one more mystery of the sea.